Good morning, my good friends. How are you all doing out there? Well, it's morning here anyway. It's probably late afternoon where you are. <laughs> oh my goodness. It is cold on the homestead this morning. And when I say cold, I'm not kidding. It's uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That's uh, 12 degrees below freezing. <laughs> Um, cause 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing. So yeah, it's chilly out there to say the least. Uh, the frost is on the pumpkins. <laughs> well, I hope we're live. Uh, I haven't seen any viewers pop up yet, but, uh, any minute now we ought to see some. So that makes me feel better. Oh, jump to 15 right away. <laughs> so I guess we're doing good. Well, I uh, got a few things to cover this morning, but I walked around this shop for, I'm not kidding you, 15 minutes. Just walked around looking at everything and pulling out drawers, opening things, trying to think, what am I going to talk about? I've already covered everything. <laughs> I, think, I think the shop talks are finished because I'm done. I, I've covered everything. <laughs> and at the last minute, I pulled something out. <laughs> I hope this will be uh, an interesting uh, demonstration for you, but I'm basically going to show you how I tap on boards to know if they're going to make a quality sound or not. And um, there's a technique to it. There, there really is. And I'll show you my technique. I'll, I, I see lots of other folks do it and, and they act like they know what they're doing, but I don't hear a tone coming out, you know. And so uh, I don't, I'm not going to mention any names or tell you who those folks are but i've heard a lot of folks do uh you know do this and um i don't think they're doing it very well so i'm going to show you how to do it and i think it'll make a lot more sense but first i got a few things to talk about here and show off uh this is kind of like a show and tell morning and um maybe a couple of shout outs and the first shout out goes to my son jr and his wife emory and emory is the one that is working in the office now she took melissa's place when melissa left and uh emory and jr are going to be celebrating their 17th wedding anniversary tomorrow so woohoo! <laughs> and they said it wouldn't last <laughs> so anyway uh that's that's pretty cool and uh you saw my son here uh I think the uh, shop talk before last, he was here and we interviewed him and he started a new channel called the Homestead Horsemanship. And he trains horses uh, for the show ring and for trail riding. And uh, so uh, check out his channel if you get a chance. I think you'll like it. He also covers a few other animals that are on the farm like some cows and sheep and all those different things. So check out homestead horsemanship if you get a minute uh, my able-bodied assistant is supposed to be putting a link out there for that as we speak so hopefully there'll be a link in the description before too long and also um, i wanted to uh, mention that my uh or shout out i guess to my daughter rochelle because she and her family are driving in from ohio tonight they won't get here till the wee hours of the morning, probably, but uh, at least they'll be here this evening, and uh, that's that's always great to have the my two little grandsons back here on the farm. They just love it here, Trinian and uh, Layton, so we'll have some fun with them this weekend. It is deer season here on the farm, and uh, you can probably count on one hand in all of the years that I've been hunting, and that's like since I was about... 12 or 13 deer hunting uh, the number of mornings that i've missed out on during the rifle season you could probably count them on one hand well today is one more of them <laughs> so it must be important to me to be here because i'm here <laughs> otherwise i'd be out there in the woods and it's especially hurtful this morning because this is the first really cold morning we've had and those big bucks like to move in the cold and uh, it is really cold out there this morning and what's uh, ironic is that yesterday morning it wasn't that cold but i did see a big buck yesterday morning for the first time that was the first big buck i've seen and uh, he was a pretty big boy i mean I, my finger was just itching on the trigger but i did not pull the trigger because uh 
I'm looking for the biggest guy in the woods. <laughs> and so far, I don't think I've seen him. Although he was, yeah, arguably, possibly the biggest guy in the woods. I just don't know. But if you shoot that one, then you can't shoot the biggest one. So, you know, I'm just waiting. I don't, I, you know, I don't have any particular desire to shoot a deer. So, if I see the really big guy and, and he just happens to work out, I'll shoot him. But otherwise, I'm just having fun sitting out there. I enjoy it. And uh, I do have a little bit of footage from out there that I'm going to share with you here in just a moment. But first, let's talk about the uh, t-shirts. Um, you can see there the t-shirts uh, that are in stock. We still have quite a few large on the uh, I Was Better, but I'm getting over it. Then over there, in the, the one next to that is the extra large, and there's none of those left. But there are a couple of 2Xs left and maybe one 3X left on that top shelf. Then over on the, uh, it's not easy being me. We've got a couple of larges. Uh, looks like one or so uh, 2Xs and maybe about three 3Xs. No extra large at all in, in any of the sizes, I might just say. Then down there on the, uh, it's simple but it's complicated, all we have is 3X there on the far right. And then on the fourth shelf now, it's everything's a hammer. We have one or two large there, but we have uh, nothing else, that's it. And then down on my logo, the only thing we have is 3X, and we only have one of those it looks like, maybe two. I think there's two. That package you see there was a return from Australia. That kind of hurt because that cost us 28 bucks to ship it to Australia and they're not accepting anything right now. So uh, that came back. So we're holding it for that fellow that hopefully we can ship it back later. Um, but that kind of kind of put a zinger on us. Um, anyway, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention here before we get uh, into a couple of videos and other things is that there's a and this is only for our local folks that are listening in there will be a bluegrass jam this evening at the Houston house in Newburgh Missouri starting around oh 615 ish 630 ish something like that so it's the Houston house in Newburgh Missouri if you're within shouting distance of that hopefully you'll make it out there this evening and we'll have a bluegrass jam um, okay, so the next thing I've got is just a little bit of footage from sitting out there deer hunting, and I think you might enjoy this. This is uh, looking out the front window of what I call my condo. And if you look really close, there is a deer walking this way, right there by the wood pile, right in the center of the screen. And it's the shaky cam, because I'm just holding my uh, phone is what I'm taking this with. So it's kind of hard, when, especially when you zoom it up, it really gets shaky. And there he is walking up uh, kind of around, around the, uh, he's kind of like circling, coming around the condo here. But look how they blend in, how their coat blends into the surroundings. It's almost like they're invisible. And now he's coming through the ditch and he's coming up right up to me and you might th think well why is he coming up that close to this building you know he's looking you can tell he's looking for something and I'll show you that here in just a moment what he's looking for you can tell I'm he's real close I thought I give you a little idea when that buck came up so close, of course, it's not going to focus on this. But I use this device here. It's a, it's a doe call. It's a doe bleat. And then the bucks hear this and they come looking for the does. So here's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's, uh, people are always asking me, how do you see so many bucks, you know? <laughs> and I, I really do see way more bucks than I see anything else. Um, and the reason is because I use that doe bleat, and I, I, I've been very successful with it. And I've called in, I mean, I really have, over the last 
10 or 15 years, I've probably called in hundreds of bucks. I really have. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would say 99% of those I did not even consider shooting. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's fun to call them in like that. You can see that guy, he had some headgear, but it was pretty little. <laughs> he was just really just barely more than spikes. And wow, we got two contributions. One from Doug Sen and Sen Ten. I can't ever say Doug's last name, <laughs> Santaniello. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry I butcher your name every time. And then we've got Baz's Workshop says he's been watching for years and it's about time he showed his gratitude. Well, thank you so very much, Baz. I appreciate that very, very much. It's, it's very kind of you guys to make those donations and those were sizable donations. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I try to provide something that I think you guys will enjoy. I hope you uh, don't mind these little distractions here, these little extra videos. Now, I bet you hardly anybody out there has this problem, and I'm going to show you this, and, and if you do, you raise your hand in the comments there. Do you guys come home to this? <laughs> That's Bella, the wonder dog. She's able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I drive up a lot and she's up there on the lookout. <laughs> uh, she's, she's something else. <laughs> and uh, we used to have a goat. My, my wife had a pet goat and the goat was the first one to get up there. And now the difference with the goat is you've got them sharp hooves. And I told her she better find a new home for that goat. <laughs> Otherwise, I was gonna get rid of the goat and she wouldn't like the way I got rid of it. <laughs> so the goat found a new home almost immediately. I mean, you're talking about a roof that takes 96 squares of shingles to apply. And that is one expensive roof. You're talking 20, thousand plus dollar roof uh, yeah so the dog he probably doesn't hurt the roof too much but it's still kind of crazy <laughs> I bet you any, nobody else has that problem uh, it's like you always see it on my shirt it's not easy being me um, let's move on I got uh, one more thing to show you here yeah, I just went ahead and did it yesterday. As a matter of fact, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I'm tired of working on that old Polaris Ranger. So I just went out and bought me a Kawasaki mule. And uh, I think it's gonna be a real nice machine. I'm real, real pleased with it so far. There it is on the trailer and uh, I'm backing it off the trailer there as you can see in those videos. Just, I basically backed it off the trailer and put my hunting clothes on and went out to my condo. <laughs> so that's that's the extent of it right now. I haven't driven it any more than that. Just out there and back and uh, it's just sitting here right now. So I'm itching to get out there and look it over in the daylight because I really haven't even seen the thing hardly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay well my little demo today is about uh, tapping on wood. I know that everybody does that, right? <laughs> Am I the only one? I could be maybe the only guy in the whole history of the world that walks around tapping on boards. <laughs> but I pretty much pick up a board and I tap on it. It's kind of the norm with me. I'm in these hardwood lumber stores and people are always looking at me like I'm weird. <laughs> I'm not weird. <laughs> Despite what you may think. Okay, so there's boards come in all shapes and sizes, you know, like this is a thicker board, but skinny. This is a real thin board, but wider. Um, about the same length, well, they are the same length. Different ways to, to make them sound off. Then you get weird shapes like this, and you might, and the only reason I'm showing you this, because, you know, an instrument itself is kind of weird shaped, and you need to know how to hold it to make it give a sound and then of course I got a piece of like Paduke and then I haven't made any progress on my uh, fancy mandolin yet the world's finest mandolin ever built by a human I have not made any progress 
And for those of you who are thinking I'm bragging here, saying that this is the world's finest mandolin ever built by a human, you need to understand that that is just my goal. I'm not saying it is that way, I'm saying, or that it will be that way. I'm saying it's my goal to make it that way. I hope it turns out that way. <laughs> But I'm going to show you how to tap on all of these different kinds of things and get the most note out of it. Because every one of them is different. So let's, let's take this, you know, blocky, skinny piece. It depends where you hold it. Now, if you hold it all the way up here at the top and you tap on it, nothing. Absolutely nothing. You get nothing. I mean, like there's no note. I mean, there is a note, you know, technically, but you can't really... Sustain, it doesn't have any sustain, and it doesn't ring, um, it doesn't really make any particular sound. So you're thinking, well, how would you get it to make a sound? You basically, it's where you hold it. It doesn't hardly matter where you tap on it, it matters where you hold it. So now I'm putting it between these two fingers, the fleshy part of my fingers, and I'm moving down. And instantly, there's a note, and it sustains. And you can move your, just a little bit of little bit of difference, just a little bit of difference where you hold it makes a huge difference in the sound and the sustain. There's almost like a balance point. Right there is really good and I can hear the cl clarity of the note. And it's, it's a much clearer note that way. It really depends on these two fingers where you hold your piece of wood. Again, same kind of thing. You hold it at the top, absolutely just dead as a doornail. You get nothing. Move your hand down. About here, it, it, there's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it kind of feels like a balance point. It's hard to explain that, but it, you'll feel it after a while and after you get used to it. Now listen. Huge difference. Up here, nothing. Just dead. Dead as a doornail. Down here, and again, this camera and this microphone is not very good. But huge, huge difference. You can just hear it sustain that long. We're up here, not any sustain, zero, none. It depends where these two fingers are. This is your most important part. Doesn't hardly matter where you tap on it. You can tap almost anywhere and make the same note. Okay? All right. On this thing, where would you hold this to make it sound? If you hold it like this, you get almost nothing. Almost nothing. Little bit that way, but very little. Here's how you would hold this. You would hold it like this, let the bulk of it hang down, hold it about here. Um, depends on where you hold it, but yeah, actually I'm not getting very much right now. There, that's a pretty good note. It really does depend on the on the piece of wood. Not getting a lot out of that, I'll be honest, but but it does depend where you hold it. I was getting a lot more when I was doing it off camera. <laughs> that's pretty good right there, but that's about as good as I'm getting. But it really does depend. You can just by moving your fingers, you can tell there's a big difference in the sound. So these two fingers are your important part. Now here's a piece of paduke. You know, it's a little bit more than a half inch thick, and it's about, oh, five inches, six inches wide, maybe. And uh, again, where you hold it makes all the difference. Nothing up here. I mean, there's a real sharp high note, but it doesn't sustain. Down here, it's going to sustain and be clear. Really clear really really clear right there sounds like a wind chime when you hold it in the right spot much much more note coming out of this than any of the rest of that stuff so I you know that's about it I just wanted to point out how you do it you you know I, I hear people just grab the board like this and, and tap on it and they go oh yeah that's good they get nothing out of it it really depends. You know, you got to, and, and you, the other thing is you want, you want to hold it so that it's free to kind of move a little bit, but yet tight enough, it doesn't slip out of your hand, of course, but, 
but as loose as you can hold it and where it doesn't slip, if that makes any sense to you. And it, that's when you'll get your best vibration, that's when you'll get your best note, and that's when you'll know if that piece of wood is any good for building an instrument. You can go into the hardwood lumber stores, try it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It makes a difference. Of course, those big heavy boards, you know, when you get a big, long, eight foot long board and you're trying to hold it up, it's a little harder, but you still, it, it all depends on where you hold it and how you tap it, you know. Not the much, again, not so much on the tapping, but it's mostly how you hold it. Well, I hope that makes sense to you. Um, Daryl Blanchard says, I built a high performance 45 caliber muzzleloader a couple of months ago. My grandson harvested a spike in a doe three weekends ago uh, in Oklahoma. It's almost not like honey. <laughs> That's pretty cool, Daryl. Daryl's been out here a couple of times, actually. He says he's seen herds of 30 to 40 deer there. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I haven't seen any herds like that here lately. <laughs> I have had some uh, remarkable days on my stand where I see quite a few. Um, I think that's about everything I was going to cover this morning. Well, with the exception of one thing, I was going to cover... Well, let me, let me finish my demo on tapping on this kind of thing. Um, really depends. This isn't carved yet, so it doesn't ring out very good yet. But when you get it carved, you're holding it about right in this area, right about in here, right, you know, where you can see me holding, is approximately where you want to hold it to make it ring. It's really not ringing very much right now because it's so thick and blocky and it's short and stubby. I mean, it just doesn't have a lot of ability to vibrate right now. So I'm not getting much out of it right now, but I just wanted to show you about where you would hold it again. And again, it's kind of like you let the bulk hang down, and uh, but if you hold it at the very top, nothing. You won't get anything. Okay. Now, last thing I just want to show, and I've shown this a thousand times already, but I still get email after email after email after email on what this thing is that I slide in to check the adjustment at the 12th fret. <laughs> Here it is one more time. It's called an in-size taper gauge. And if you look at it, it's thick here and it gets thin, thin, thin. It's down to 10 thousandths of an inch thick at the very tip and it's 150 thousandths of an inch here. Now, if you divide those numbers by 40, then you'll know about how many, you know, about how many millimeters that is. So if you take 150 divided by 40, so it's three point something millimeters up here at this end. But anyway, um, so it's not going to focus on that, of course. It's not, it, it's not even possible to focus on that, but it's called an in-size taper gauge, and the number on it is 4630-1E. Now leave me alone, okay? That's what it is. <laughs> I, I really do. I get more emails on that. You just wouldn't even believe how many emails I get on that. It's crazy. But it really is a good tool. I mean, seriously, a good tool. Now, don't expect to go get this for five bucks, ten bucks, twenty bucks. No, it's sixty-six or sixty-seven dollars. It's an expensive tool, but it's a very accurate, you know, machinist tool is what it is. It's not a, it's not an instrument tool, you know, a musical instrument tool. It's a machinist tool, but it works perfectly for instruments. It's really the best thing I ever found. Uh, to do this work with. Okay, it looks like we got our questions going here, so let's get started. Doug, the fellow I keep messing up his name, <laughs> asks, do you figure you will uh, live out all your days on the farm? Yeah, and that may not be that long. <laughs> Uh, the way I'm going right now, Doug, it, it, it seems like it couldn't be more than a couple of weeks away. <laughs> oh, I laugh to keep from crying, I really do. No, it's, yeah, it's, I have no visions of going anywhere else other than maybe the, uh, the old, uh, senile home or something. That's about it. And that, they'll have to, you know, I'll be scratching and clawing if they drag me there. But anyway, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> he says, uh, Daryl says, 22% from the end will give you your best resonance. 
Well, now, I'm not just sure how you're going to calculate that on an odd-shaped piece of wood, Daryl, but okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> but I would say you're probably pretty close to right there. That, that would probably be pretty close. Um, question marks. Your opinion, does tone wood uh, resonate matter in electric instruments? Well, rain blaze, I got to tell you, I'm not an electric instrument expert, and I would say for the most part, no. I would say it doesn't make that much difference. For the, for the electric instruments, I would say it would be more about um, feel and, you know, like in other words, the weight of it, you know, like some things are just crazy heavy and you may not want it, or, or you may want that because of the sustain aspect of the heavy and heaviness. But, I mean, you know, so that would be one aspect I would think you'd be concerned about with your electric would be the, the weight of it, the feel of it. And then the other one is just the appearance, you know, the looks. Um, otherwise, I don't think the resonance part makes that much difference. Um, <clears throat> that's just my opinion. You know, everybody's got an opinion. Uh, I can't say this name either. Apilicus. Apilicus? I think. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations on F5 mandolin templates or tips on making your own? Well, you know, I'll be perfectly truthful. I made mine off of the, uh, my patterns and thicknesses and all that were off of that 1924 Lloyd Lore uh, Gibson mandolin that I took apart. And uh, I don't share those particular numbers. So that's where I get mine. I know there's a lot of other patterns out there and there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information even available on the thicknesses of, of other Lloyd Lore mandolins. So, I mean, if you do a little research, I'm sure you can find something, but to tr be truthful, I don't have a recommendation, unfortunately. Do we set the time back one hour? Yes, we do. Uh, we fall back in the fall one hour and we spring forward in the spring one hour. Yes. There's people trying to change that, but right now that's the way we do it. I agree. Tone wood does not affect the tone of an electric guitar. Yeah, I, you know, because I mean, they make them out of everything, <laughs> literally. Uh, you know, they make electric guitars. And, and, you know, it's all about the electronics. Your electronics is very important in an electric guitar, of course, and all the different combinations and, you know, ways to mix and match all that stuff. And I am definitely no expert on that, but I do know all of that matters. I just watched the video on the last hurrah guitar when you installed the binding on, uh, mentioned that you were using tape that had already been used. What kind of tape do you use? Well, I just get the binding tape from Stuart McDonald and, you know, I, you know, I'll just to be thrifty or just not to waste so much stuff, I'll, I will occasionally reuse the tape. I don't do it very often, but I do try to use it, reuse it when I can. And when I don't have a lot of stress on something, it works just fine. In that particular case, with that kind of binding, it probably wasn't the best choice. Um, but I just, you know, th this file cabinet right here, I just pull out the drawer and when I peel the tape off the guitar, I just stick the end right up. I clean this off where there's no dust on it, you understand. And then I just stick the tape right along here and uh, just the end of the tape. And then I can peel it off there really quick and put it back on the guitar. So, I, you know, it does work to reuse it occasionally, but it, it's not always your best option. I'm not saying that you should do that every time. But if you're trying to be, you know, thrifty and maybe a little bit you know, world conscious where you're not just wasting stuff all the time, then that's why I do it. Um, how are the hands? Yeah, they're not good. And I'm not really going to go into that, but they're just not good. And it ain't getting no better. <laughs> um, if a complete amateur wanted to take a stab at building an acoustic guitar, where would they begin? A pre-cut kit. Yeah, a kit is probably a good idea. Um, I've said this before, and uh, I know this is not about building a guitar, 
but I just think it's a super good book on all the different techniques and the understandings and all that. And that's the Roger Simonoff book, which I have up on the shelf there. You can't see it. But you can buy that Roger Simonoff book on how to build an F-style mandolin from Stuart McDonald and other places. Um, that book's really good. And, it, you know, I built my first guitar based on what I learned out of that book. And I really did. And, and that book doesn't tell you anything about building guitars. Don't get me wrong. It just tells you about how to build an instrument and understand acoustics and different things that you need to understand. I think the book's excellent. I really do. So you might want to get that book, read that book a couple of times through. I read it eight times before I built my first mandolin. And that is not an exaggeration. I read it cover to cover eight times. Um, just because I could, I guess. And I guess I was obsessed. <laughs> I don't have a problem. <laughs> I'm not obsessed. <laughs> I really, I really was obsessed on the first one. I'm not kidding you. You probably never met anybody that was more obsessed about doing something than I was on my first mandolin. Uh, hey, Jerry from uh, Memphis. Thanks for your knowledge and insight. Helps me a lot. Well, you're sure welcome, Stu. I appreciate that. You know, I'm glad it helps, folks. I, yeah, yeah, again, I, I just want to say one more time. I've said this a bunch of times. I, you know, I don't feel like I'm the authority on everything. I just tell you how I do certain things, and I hope it makes sense to you, you know. And that's, there's a million ways to do everything, everything. There just seriously are. I just show you the way I do it. And generally, I try to tell you why I do it that way because I have a reason usually whenever I do something. I hope third time we'll get an answer. Good morning, Mr. Rosa. I love your work. Is it true you will not make any more instruments soon? Um, <clears throat> well, Mo, I, you know, I've returned all the deposits on all the commissions I had. Um, I just... You know, the hands have just gone too far, and I just, I'm just tired of dealing with it and, uh, you know, feeling the pressure too much to try to get the instruments out and all that. And I'm, I'm also going to slow the repair work down because of that. Uh, I'm not going to quit. I'm just slowing it all way down. And uh, Caleb understands that he's going to be gone at least by Christmas, if not before. So, um, you know. <laughs> Unless he just wants to come here and hang out. You know, I mean, he can do that if he wants. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's just it's just time, you know. I retired in uh, at age 46 from AT&T, and now I'm going to retire at age 67 here <laughs> again, um, which is the normal retirement age, by the way. So anyway, it's time. Let's see here. I'm looking for the next question mark. Again, uh, in case you are here for the first time, be sure to put question marks in front of your question so I can find it. <clears throat> can you explain the difference between the uh, bluegrass and country music? Well, you know, the old time country and, and bluegrass, there's not a whole lot of difference uh, except for the speed. That's kind of what everybody always said. You know, uh, bluegrass is old time uh, country, just a lot faster. Uh, and that's not 100% true. There's a lot of slow bluegrass songs too. But um, that's probably the biggest difference is that uh, bluegrass has a real drive to it most of the time. And... Uh, it's kind of a little bit more punchy, you know, just a little faster type music and a little quicker beat. That's probably the main biggest difference. Uh, the bluegrass is also pretty much, well, at least it always used to be. Now they're, you know, changing everything. Just like, just like they butchered country music, they're trying to butcher bluegrass too. And they're, they're introducing all the new, you know, high-tech equipment into bluegrass, just like they did with country and you see where country is now it's not like it used to be at all it's more like pop music if you ask me most of the new country anyway but the old country was you know had a lot of electric instruments steel guitar and all that kind of thing well bluegrass was 99.9 percent .9 acoustic now occasionally even people like bill monroe and 
and Flatt and Scruggs and different people like that would introduce a drum here and there and they would introduce a piano or something else but for the most part it was just purely acoustic you know instruments <clears throat> so that's my take on it hope that makes sense and boy I touched it and this thing scrolled <laughs> a long way uh, oh my gosh so let me get back up here again man it really scrolled a long way that time Sorry, it just takes me a while to find where I was. Okay, here we go. Have you ever used any tools or supplies from LMI? Yes, I have quite a bit actually, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't go to them all that often. I, and I guess the main reason is I don't find their stuff as easy to locate on their site. I don't feel like their site is as well designed for me personally. Um, it's a good, you know, they got good, good stuff and they and I got nothing. I, I, I'm not knocking them other than I just find their site not quite as user friendly for the way I think of a site. You know, that's probably the biggest reason I don't use more stuff from there. Um, but I have bought a lot from them over the years. Recently, I've seen you use Titebond 3 instead of the original. Can you explain the difference? Well, Titebond 3, I, you know, I, Titebond original is perfectly good enough for everything, okay, on the, on the wooden instruments. I, I just happened to have some Titebond 3 in the shop here, and it was handy. And if I'm gluing something that I never, ever, ever, ever want to come apart again, I say put the type on three on it. It doesn't hurt anything. Like for instance, if it's a crack and you want the crack to close up and you don't ever want it to open again, well, type on three is a good choice. It, you know, it, the type on three is more water resistant, moisture resistant, and all that. So I wouldn't put type on three like on your fretboard uh, because you might want to have to take the fretboard off sometime. You know, and uh, so the regular tight bond would be a far better choice if it's something that you think you will need to take apart again. For instance, the neck joint, I would use regular tight bond, not the tight bond 3, because if you ever have to steam it off or whatever, it's going to be pretty hard with the tight bond 3. My bet is the tight bond 3 would come apart also, but, but Truthfully, I think you'd be better, I'd be, be wise to just use regular tight bond, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's something you think you might have to take apart again. So that's the difference. Thinking about old guitars, where the 12th fret meets the body rather than the 14th fret, what difference do you think it makes in the sound or, or is that simplifying things too much? Well, Bill, I got to be honest. I don't. I don't build the twelve, uh, twelfth fret uh, guitars and stuff, and so I don't really have that much experience on the difference uh, when I'm building them and stuff to know what the difference might be. And on the other ones, for the most part, I'm just working on fixing whatever the problem is, and I don't just sit down and study that. that. So the truth is, I don't think I have a good answer for you. I, I would answer it if I. I don't want to just say things when I don't really feel like I know what I'm talking about. There's probably other people that have comments on that that will comment in the, in the, in the comment section. So maybe you'll learn something from that. But uh, <clears throat> no, I'm not going to try to tell you I'm an expert on something like that if I don't know. And I really don't think I know the difference and what, what the difference would be and what the, what the effects would be. So I'm not going to comment. Um, Brett dressing file. Stu Mac has files that have a center crown and also an uh, off center crown. What are the applications of each? Well, the truth is, I don't know that one either. And that's just because I've never used the offset ones. Um, you've seen me modify mine. Now, I don't use the ones that you're talking about, I think. Those are the long, long files I think you're referring to. I use the little short one with the inserts. <clears throat> this is the one I use and it's the only one I use and it's the only one I've ever bought so you know maybe the other ones are better you know but I feel like this does everything I need to do so I just never have ventured out 
to try anything else. You know, something's working, I don't see any reason to change it. But the only thing I do is uh, on this one, uh, if you look at it, this is the big wide one and I ground off the outer edges, just the outer edges. I left the center, of course, and I just I, I ground the outer edges off so that I can rotate it on the fret as I'm as I'm grinding. And the reason I did that was because um, I can use it. This works better for me to round over quickly. Uh, this is the biggest one. And so like on medium guitar frets, I'll still use this one and just rotate it like this as I go across the fret and it rounds them off much faster for me. Uh, with my technique, this works the best. And the reason I ground off the edges is so I don't scratch the fretboard. So that's what I've done with my fret tool. So, But I, I don't always use this particular insert. I do use the small one and the medium ones also, but for the when I'm just rounding them off, a lot of times I will go to this bigger bigger one. It seems to work faster for me. But again, I'm rotating it as I go, you know. I don't just push right straight down the middle, you know. Okay. Anyway, that's how I do it. Um <clears throat> when you are taking off high spots from a duff tail neck with carbon paper. Can you use a finger plane uh, to take off the high spots instead of a chisel? Yeah, you can, uh, you, and I have done that, but for the most part, especially depending on the dovetail, the angle will make it hard to get the finger plane in there, and so that's why I use the chisel most of the time. <clears throat> if it's If it's something where I have to remove a lot of wood and I need to be very careful, I might try to use the finger plane um, because the finger plane I'm really you know I hate hate to just say it like I'm bragging but I'm really good with my finger plane I can yeah I can I can take off a hair if I need to take off a hair you know without touching the rest of it and and so the finger plane is very good for me to use but I most of the time you just can't get it in there because of the angle the acute angle that it has and so you can't get your finger plane in there is the only reason I use the chisel um, okay. You tend to think of bluegrass as being older and more traditional. Well, technically, it's not. Uh, bluegrass really didn't hit big till, I'm trying to say the late 30s, early 40s, somewhere in there, uh, is when it kind of hit, when Bill Monroe kind of hit with it. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates, but it's in that time frame. And, and old time country was going on way b well before that. So, so technically it's the other way around, but uh, it may sound like bluegrass is older because it's really from the uh, the old timey type of music. That's where it comes from, you know. So it probably does sound that way, but actually it's the other way around. Have you ever seen a mandolin built by Dixie M Michelle or Mitchell? Uh, she was a talented luthier. I don't recall. I don't think I have, Lloyd. So, sorry, I don't think I've seen that. Dixie Mitchell, Michelle, or what, how, however you pronounce that last name. With the E on the end, it makes me want to say Michelle. Uh, Mitchell would probably not have the E on the end, so I don't know. Anyway, oh man, it just scrolled again, <laughs> way up. Uh, <clears throat> doggone it. Okay, here we go. I'm, I'm back to where I was. Now I just got to find the next question mark. Have you ever re-graduated a violin? I believe my old German fiddle is not uh, graduated properly. Well, just because you ask, yes, I have re-graduated a violin. Um, my grandfather, when he passed away, I inherited his uh, old fiddle. And at that time, I already had, you know, a good number of years under my belt uh, doing this. And um, I, I could just tell it just didn't have the sound I was looking for in a fiddle. Now. You know, in one hand, I probably should not have changed anything on it. But on the other hand, it just had a harsh sound to me. So I uh, took it apart and re-graduated the top some. And uh, man, it's it's got a nice sound now. It's very clear, very loud, uh, sounds so much better to me. 
and uh, I'm very happy with it. And of course, the outside appearance is still just like he left it, but but the inside I re I did recarve. So yeah, that's as far as I can remember. At least that's the one I remember the best of recarving an old fiddle. Uh, but yeah, you can do it. It it just and um, I've e I think I've even done it on a mandolin somewhere along the line. Definitely built new mandolin tops for mandolins. I'm trying to remember if I ever built a fiddle top for a fiddle. You know, that, that came in the shop that didn't have a top or the top was so bad I had to make a new one. I kind of think I did that once too. But it's been so long. Doug asks, uh, how about offering a guitar build class where you come out and stay at the farm for a couple of weeks and work extensively? Yeah, I would like to do that, Doug. I really, really would like to do that. Um, I, I tried to do it just about the time I started on YouTube or maybe a little bit before that and uh, it all fell through. I just, you know, everybody canceled or didn't show or whatever, you know, it just kind of fizzled out. So I just didn't do it. But I would like to do that, have classes here. I think that would be really fun. I would enjoy that. I love to teach. Uh, I've always loved to teach. Um, ask Caleb. I, you know, I've been in his face for two years now. <laughs> Not really. I, I pretty much let Caleb do his thing. I just point a, point a few things at him and, and say, go, <laughs> you know. But uh, no, I do like to teach. So if, if, if there's a lot of people that are interested in that and I start to see the interest, we'll, maybe we'll try to start that up again. What's the most important lesson you've learned through your experience in building uh, instruments and, and are you going to document your building of the goat greatest of all time mandolin yes I'm already starting to film uh, the goat that's a good <laughs> that's, a, that's a good explanation there uh, yeah I've already started filming uh, on on building this mandolin and I will film the whole thing and uh, show it there will be a lot of videos on this probably because it's going to be super detailed. It's going to be super different. Uh, I've actually built several other mandolins very similar to the way I'm building this one. Um, I'm hoping this one will be even better than some of those. Like that Carmine D'Amico mandolin. Uh, that one was a 10 string. I'm not going to make a 10 string because I wouldn't know how to play it. And, you know, I really want to make keep it practical. So it's going to be just a standard mandolin. But... Uh, but other than that, it's not, it's going to be anything but standard. <laughs> so yeah, I'll have it all documented for you. But what's the most important lesson I've learned? Customer service, really. I mean, <laughs> that's going to sound crazy, but that's pretty much it. If you're going to do this for a living, you better learn how to treat your customers right. That's probably the biggest thing. Now, I have to tell you, the customer service thing, I didn't really learn that doing this. I actually learned that at AT&T because we went through six weeks of intense customer training, or, you know, customer interaction training, if you will. Six weeks of very intense training on how to treat customers and things. It was super intense. Now, this was back in the old school days when customer service mattered, they don't care anymore. <laughs> and neither does AT&T. Nobody cares anymore. And that's the truth. But back then, it did matter. And, you know, the old customer's always right thing was pretty much drilled into your head. But I carry that forward to this. And I think it's very important here. So that would be my most important lesson. Can I uh, explain the tap tuning of a mandolin top and how I achieve what I'm trying to get? Well, yeah, sort of. You know, I don't look in the book, in that Semenov book, he really makes it kind of like scientific. That was probably the only part of the book that I've kind of strayed from, to be truthful, because I don't know, for some reason, 
the scientific aspect of it, I don't know, just, just didn't do it for me. Even though I know that he's right, you know, or probably right, I should say, that's not how I do it. So that's the one thing I do stray different than the book on that Simonoff book. He's, use, he's using a strobe tuner and, you know, and all kinds of special gadgets to tap with. And, you know, he's talking about semitones and all these kinds of technical jargon. Well, I don't do that. All I do is I pick up the board, I tap on it, and I listen. And often you're going to hear a couple of different notes. And as you learn how to carve, as you carve, you need to keep listening and seeing what effect your carving is having on that note. When I, you know, and of course I'm checking my measurements too. The thicknesses are very, 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 very important. So that's probably the most important thing of all is the thicknesses. But when I get the thicknesses about where I want them and the note app comes together as a clear note, then I'm done. You know, I want a clear note. And you and you just, you're tapping on that and you're kind of hearing, you know, a little bit of dissonance in the note a lot of times. But when it comes together and you go, tong, and you can hear it one note, you know, then you know you're there. Um, I try to land on a note that will, um, you know, not be an open string. You know, if if you land on, say, like a D note on a on a mandolin, well, then your D string is going to be really loud. Um, you know, so you try to land on a note that's kind of off of that. Um, that's not an open string. You know, on that uh, last hurrah guitar, I think we landed on that top. We landed on an F sharp, which is perfect. You know, because it's not there on an open string. You know. So you try to land on something like that, and you, you learn how to carve, and um, a higher arch will give you a higher pitched tone, you know. The lower, flatter thing will give you a more depth in tone. Um, so, you know, you want to try to, you know, the more delicate it is, typically the more deeper it's going to sound, believe it or not. Um, the more wood that's there, the more harsh it sounds. Uh, carving around the outer edges tends to deepen the note a little bit. Um, yeah, it's just kind of experience. I don't have any absolute black and white 100% guaranteed ways to do it. I wish I did. And if I'd have documented more of it over the years as I was doing it, I probably would be able to draw better conclusions than what I just told you. But that's kind of how I do it. It's mostly about hearing that clarity of note. Do I ever use sanding sealer on a guitar? Well, Matt, yeah, I've put out a bunch of videos on how much I hate sanding sealers and pore fillers and grain fillers and all that. I, I don't have anything against them in the sense that I don't think they hurt anything too much other than the ones that do hurt something. And some of them change the color of the wood. Some of them, you know, the when they fill the pores, you can see it, um, you know, all that stuff. To me, is just garbage. Throw that stuff away if it's doing that. Um, my problem with sanding sealers and, and pore fillers, grain fillers, is they just don't do what they're supposed to do. You know, you got to put them on. Oh, they do too. You know, I've had people argue with me. They have that thing works, that works perfect. Aqua Coat works great. You put it on four times and it works, you know, it feels like, you just said, you put it on four times. Well, I got to put the finish on four, five, six times anyway. So why do, why do I want to mess with the damn Aqua Coat? Sorry, I didn't mean to say that word. <laughs> but anyway, why do I want to mess with that? You know, and that's my thing about that stuff is it doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And I've, I've had the CEOs of two of those different companies on the phone talking to them about it. And they couldn't convince me that it works either. So, you know, and, and they kind of agree that what I'm saying is true. You know, it, it's, it just takes what it takes. Well, I don't need that junk. Plus, you don't know what it's doing to your sound anyway. So I just don't bother with them. That's, that's my problem with the things. If, if they worked, I'd use them. Aquacoat specifically uh, turned my Paduk 
like pumpkin orange. I mean, it just, actually it was between pumpkin and melon orange. Just weird color. And, you know, being colorblind, it, I could see how weird it looked, but, you know, people were telling me exactly how it looked, and it looked horrible. It, it looked horrible to me, too. So, you know, I don't know. It, I just don't like those things. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> it's not that they don't work technically, because they do, but you just got to you, you put them on five or six times, four or five times. Why do I need that? I just don't need it. Good morning, Jerry from Christie. Uh, first, thanks for giving your son a shout out. Well, you're welcome. Have you ever played classical on the mandolin? Uh, about that much, you know, seriously, just just the least little tiny bit, you know, I, not really. I've never done anything uh, serious about that. I have listened to some classical in my time. I'm not a big classical fan. Uh, I definitely appreciate it and appreciate how wonderful it is, but I, I'm just, it's just not what I'm into, you know, it's not, it's not, I have nothing against it. Um, it's just not what I'm into, but uh, I've listened to, you know, Vivaldi and the Four Seasons and, you know, some other stuff and, uh, but I don't claim to be any kind of an expert on any of that at all. So no, not really, just, just where I've heard people playing it and I've been there with them, I'll pick at it a little bit, but I'm not very good at it. I'll just tell you straight up and down. Could you explain how dual action truss rod works, please? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Larry, you just want to get me going, don't you? <laughs> you guys are picking on all the stuff I don't like this morning. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, dual acting truss rods should be outlawed by the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> you know, you just you just don't need them. Number one, I mean, like it's fixing a problem we don't even have. Uh, nobody needs to put, uh, you know, an overbow or what some people call a backbow or whatever. You can use any term you want to, but nobody needs to bend. Uh, I mean, put an, I'm sorry, put an underbow. Nobody needs to put an underbow in your uh, instrument. It's going to pull in there naturally. So there's no reason to have an adjustment to put an underbow in an instrument. I mean, there just is no reason. The only reason would be if you really screwed up and you built it with a huge arch in your thing. And if you did that, you deserve what you got. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty easy to make something flat, you know, and if you make it flat and then you put strings on it, it's going to pull an underbow in it. So you need nothing to, to force an underbow. That's going to happen no matter what you want to happen, that will happen. So the only truss rod you need is a single acting truss rod that pulls that underbow out. That's all you need. End of discussion. So. How do they work? Only one of them really works. The other one is screwed up 80% of the time. I've, I've mentioned it many times, and I am not exaggerating this point. I'm telling you for black and white certainty. When people come in, and, they've, and they'll, they will start off by saying, I think this thing needs a truss rod adjustment, or you know, it's got too much of a this or that, you know. I'll check it, and sure enough, it'll have one of those two-way truss rods, and they've turned it backwards, and they have forced an underbow into their neck. So I just turn it the other way, take the underbow out, hand it back to them, basically. And I'm talking like eight out of ten times that's happened, and I'm not exaggerating. That happens all the time. So to me, that's why they should be outlawed by the Supreme Court is because people don't know righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. They just don't understand it, and they, and they turn them the wrong way. So there you go. I'm off my soapbox, Larry. Don't ever ask that again. <laughs> uh, I'm just being silly, guys. It's, it is kind of that way, though. It really is. It's crazy. Um, we're just about out of time here. Let's, like, let's look at this question. Is there different gauge mandolin strings? Uh, 
fixing an octo mandolin uh, from the 20s and worried uh, string tension. Uh, well, let me just say this about that. <laughs> Certainly you can put all kinds of different uh, gauge strings on your instruments. I would tend to go toward the light side of that. So whatever you think it is, uh, it never hurts to go too light. You can always go heavier. But if you go too heavy, you might regret it. So I would stick to the light side of whatever you're trying to do. Uh, but I gotta be perfectly honest and tell you that I am definitely no expert in an octave type mandolin. I know very little about them. I, I know a lot about standard mandolins, but I don't know much about the other family of mandolins. That's just being truthful. I know almost nothing about that stuff. All right, let's see if I can find one more question and it just scrolled up way up there again. Um, he says, I'm your age and I too old to learn to play the mandolin. It's not got much to do with your age, uh, other than, you know, the physical parts. You know, like if, if you physically have trouble like I do with my hands, well, it might be a little late to start if you've got super much trouble that way. But otherwise, I mean, if you're reasonably okay with your hands, it really has very little to do with your age. It really has more to do with uh, timing. You know, people always talk about, what is it, the five senses, you know, smell, sight, hearing, you know, all that stuff, and your sense of touch and all that. But there is another sense that they never talk about, and it's a complete, absolute, 100% sense, just like everything else. It's timing. You have a natural timing in your body, and you, and, and you can hear it, you can feel it, you know, there's a timing. It's a sense. And if you don't have that sense, just like you could be blind, you can, you know, you can't smell, you can't taste, whatever. If you don't have the sense of timing, then you're wasting your time. In other words, if you can't keep and you know keep a steady beat going when you're listening to music and stay right with them, you get off, you know. Yeah, and we all hear it from stage, you know, we hear people getting off on the time and the, and, the, and the clapping and the rhythm and things. If you can't keep time, you are going to frustrate yourself and everybody around you. Timing is the only thing that really matters when you're playing music. It, it truly is the super most important thing. You know, in real estate, they say location, location, location. Well, in music, it's timing, timing, timing. <laughs> so that would be your biggest thing. The age has almost nothing to do with it. The, uh, the uh, other than the physical part, you know. But if you're physically able, I, my oldest student started at just about age 70 and she's still going and plays, at, you know, in a little, you know, local, band kind of a jam band you know uh, at nursing homes and things and uh, she's just having a ball you know and uh, she's that was a long time ago she's got to be in her 80s by now <laughs> so you know and she's still playing so there you go I'm gonna call that good and I'm gonna go out there and play with my new toy my new four-wheel toy <laughs> And I'm going to get back out there in the woods. Uh, it's been tough getting in the in the shop this week. I got to be honest with deer season on, and it goes through another. Uh, I think up through Tuesday of next week. So, for from now till then, I'm going to probably be spending most of my time in the woods just because I enjoy it so much. Um, Y'all have a great day. I'll see you next Friday, same time, same place. Thanks for joining me this morning. Yeah, yeah.